all of you tonight to the fourth week of our studies of the epistle of John. It is said that when St. John was very old and he could no longer preach and say too many things, he used to repeat over and over again, Tekniamu, my children, love one another, love one another. He's not only the theologian of purity, virginity, but also the theologian of truth and love. Last week we were saying that Christ walked in truth and love, and we must also walk the same path. We must, we must walk the way he did. I think last week we stopped at verse 7 of the second chapter, and I will read very quickly. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So here he's talking about an old commandment and a new commandment. But what he wants to say is that the summation of all commandments is love. The cross-section of all the commandments is love. And that's why we read in Matthew chapter 22, when a teacher, a teacher of the law asks Christ, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And at that point, Christ took the first four commandments that, and he just squeezed them together and he made one. And he says, love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now, he did not erase the other commandments. Uh, he just kind of squeezed them together. And he gave us the very essence of our Christian path. It says that God is love. God is love. And we are created in his image, so we are to walk in love. Without agape love, we are not healthy individuals. Actually, it is almost impossible to love our neighbor correctly if we don't first learn how to love God. So we're talking about ontological love here, the love of Christ, not the loves of the world. Only the love of God will remain with us through eternity. St. Paul says that kind of love does not fade away. It never passes away. It never dies. So this is the love we must seek in our lives. Again, agape love, the love of God, the love that St. Paul is talking about and St. John is talking about is the highest fruit of the Holy Spirit and it presupposes the sacrifice of our passions and the keeping of the commandments. So if we truly love our neighbor, we will not lie to him. We will not trick him. We will not belittle him. We will not become jealous of his things. We will not take anything that belongs to him. Because we have a lot of children here tonight, I'm going to say a wonderful story from the life of St. John the Sinite. St. John lived during the 6th century, and at some point he was outside of his monastery, and a porcupine you guys know what a porcupine is? <laughs> you know, okay. It has like uh, needles, I think, right, Panayoti? It's not an animal you want to hug. You don't want to do that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think uh, snakes don't even approach them because porcupines, they can defend themselves very well. They have these needles. They just become a ball and then <laughs> nobody can touch them. So the mother porcupine is coming through the gates of the monastery carrying her baby in her mouth. And she brings the baby and lays it at the feet of St. John. And St. John saw that this baby was born blind. So he did exactly what Christ did. He spat down on the ground. He made a little mud. He took some of that clay, put it on the eyes of a porcupine, and the porcupine was healed immediately. And the mother was so happy that she went and kissed the feet of St. John, took her baby. The baby just followed her because now the baby could see, and they walked away very happy. The next day, Dr. Sotiri, 
the porcupine mother wanted to pay her medical bill. So okay. she came so she came to the monastery again, dragging a huge cabbage. And she brings the cabbage and lays it at the feet of the saint. And the saint looked at the cabbage and smiled and said, Let me ask you, I don't think you grew this. Where'd you take this from? No doubt you took it from the garden of one of the fathers. Now listen to me. I don't need stolen things, so please take it back and put it where you found it. And the animal did obedience and immediately took the cabbage, being a little ashamed, and took it back and put it where it belonged. Now he could have said, wow, this is a miracle. God gave it to me. This, is, this came from God. No, that's how precisely they kept the commandments. So obviously there are some prerequisites to this healing gift And one of these prerequisites is purity of the heart. Now today, in today's generations, these things may sound like fable. People have a hard time believing these things. Some seminarians, instead of saying the lives of the saints, they were calling them the lies of the saints. What? The lies? The lies. The lies. They don't have the faith to believe that these things are possible. This is the Western mindset because we left the holy tradition of our church behind. We left the tradition that makes saints behind. We have developed a Western mindset and an intellectual faith, an intellectual faith that is not any different than the faith of the unbelievers, according to Father John of Romanides. That's why it's so important to read these wonderful books of the Desert Fathers, the books of Ever Yetinos. There's four volumes amazing books because that's where you're going to understand how these fathers followed the gospel precisely. So we will see and get a glimpse of this kind of love in the 15th chapter of St. John. And we'll see there some of the some of the prerequisites of this love. And a lot of this is included on Holy Thursday night in chapter 15. I am the vine. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So as Christians, we must bear fruit. Every branch that does not bear fruit, my father will take away. That branch will be withered. We are withering today because we do not develop fruits of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the church is not to make us good people. It's not to make us ethical people. We're supposed to possess the Holy Spirit and have obvious fruits of the Holy Spirit. So we need to become fruitful Christians. And some of the highest fruits of the Holy Spirit is peace, joy, and love. But to bear this kind of fruit, we must first be clean from egotism, sinful passions, sins of the flesh, And that's what Christ tells us in that chapter, in verse 3. He tells the disciples, you are clean, you are pure, because of my word. So the apostles, for three years with Christ, they were purified by keeping his word, by keeping his commandments. In that chapter, verse 7, Christ says, if you abide in me, if you walk like I did, and my words become your possession... If you live by my commandments, you will not sin, and you will be full of the Holy Spirit. What keeps us connected to Christ, to the grace of Christ, and to the energy of the Holy Spirit, is the precise keeping of the commandments. And that's what he says, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Now, listen to what makes sense. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. In verse 12, in that chapter, Christ takes all the commandments and gives us the essence and the center of all the commandments. This is my commandment. So he was the lawgiver from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he gave a lot of commandments. Christ is the God of the Old Testament. He's the lawgiver, the one who gave The law on Mount Sinai was Christ before the Incarnation. To the Jews, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But now he raises the bar 
for his disciples. For his disciples, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is like his final commandment right before the crucifixion. Now he's saying all this before the cross. He says, you are my friends. He's speaking to his disciples. And to his disciples, he says, this is my commandment. This is how the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So St. John here says that, you know about the old commandment, the old commandments of love. Love your neighbor as yourself and do not covet, do not steal, do not bear false witness. All these things is really expressing love for your neighbor. But now, a new commandment, says St. John. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Not just to love your neighbor as yourself, but to love your neighbor even above yourself. If you're ready to die, so your brother can live. And then he mentions just this in verse 13 of that same chapter. There is no greater love in this world than to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's exactly what Christ did. So true Christian love is sacrificial. St. Nicholas Planas, one of the most humble priests of Athens about a hundred years ago, was doing a holy unction service somewhere in his parish. I believe he's a saint. Yes, he is. He was canonized saint. I think March 2nd. And the hosts who requested the holy unction service, they were kind enough, and they told him, Father, if you have a little bit of extra time, go next door. There's a paralytic there. There's a man who's paralyzed. Just go and bless him with a holy oil. St. Nicholas says, I would love to. Knocks on the door, walks in. And he finds the paralytic sitting there. And he says, uh, what is your name, my son? He says, my name is Yakovos. And St. Nicholas says, that's wonderful. You have a great name. Your name after Yakovos, the brother of God. Yakovos the Adelphotheos in Greek. Translated, the brother of God. Here we say, the brother of the Lord. It's the same thing. But at that moment, Yakovos told him, Father, I don't believe. I'm an agnostic. And by the way, I heard something on TV here the other day that uh, the Panagia had many other children. Is that right? He was blaspheming. The saint didn't say a word. They sit there to try to teach him. He walked out, said goodbye, thank you, blessed him, and he left. I don't know what most of our Christians would do today after something like that. Either become upset or even have some bad thoughts about this individual. How can you be thinking like this? But St. Nicholas Planas, he was a man of love. He loved all his children, good and bad alike. So he went home. He knelt on the floor and prayed all that night for Yaakovos the paralytic. Prayed for his soul. A couple hours after midnight, a man entered the paralytic's room. And the paralytic said, who are you? What are you doing here? I am St. Yaakovos and Father Planas send me here to heal you. The paralytic was instantly healed. He believed, he walked, and he was saved. This is the kind of love that we have in orthodoxy. This kind of love doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by just reading the Bible. Of course, it's a gift. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, but it takes synergy. That's why it's called a fruit and not just a gift. Fruits of the Holy Spirit require our effort to purify our heart. Now, why can't we do miracles like that? We can. God has to. He can work a miracle through anyone. Remember Balaam? Who remembers Balaam, the sorcerer of the Old Testament? Who remembers that name from our studies over the years? Who was Balaam? At some point, the king of the Moabites, he saw about two million Israelites land across his border. And they're coming to occupy the promised land. So when Balak, the king of the Moabites, when he saw this crowd, he was petrified. He says, they're going to clean up this land like a cow cleans a field. They will leave nothing for us. We're We're going to starve. So he thought right away, I need to do something. I have to call Balaam the sorcerer to put a curse on the Israelites. 
is going to curse them, and then some kind of a plague is going to destroy them. So he brings this sorcerer, and God told this sorcerer, don't go. An angel of the Lord told him, don't go. But I, I don't think he was quite convinced because they were coming and promising him a lot of money. If you come, we're going to give you so much money and then a lot more gifts, a lot more gold. Because he was greedy, he didn't go because he was a little bit afraid. And because God saw his heart that he really wanted to go, he says, okay, go. But say exactly what I put in your mouth. Balaam is going on his donkey. And at some point, he hit his leg on the wall of a cliff. And then the donkey spoke. Why are you hitting me? Can you not see the angel of the Lord in front of you with a stretched sword? I'm trying to avoid the angel. You see, animals can speak if God wants them to. So after this, Balaam went to the king, but told the king, I can't help you because the God of Israel is protecting them. And when Instead of cursing Israel, he began to praise them and heap all kinds of blessings on them, even saying prophecies. Balaam was the one who prophesied about the star of Bethlehem, about Christmas. So God is not limited. God can work through anybody. Sometimes we hear that a miracle happened with a Muslim person or a miracle happened. That's not amazing. Don't let that scandalize us. Just because a miracle happens in a Protestant setting or somewhere else, all of a sudden, oh, we have the truth. Because no, a miracle is never a criterion of the truth. We have saints who healed a lot of Muslim women from infertility. St. Arsenios in the books that we have read. But eventually this Balaam told Balak, the only way you're going to destroy the Israelites, listen to this, listen to the words of the devil. Listen to this. If you want to destroy the people of God, you can't do it because God is protecting them. If you want to destroy them, get them to sin. If you get them to sin, then the grace of God will leave them. And that's exactly what happened. That evil king, he went to the leaders of Israel and he told them, please, you're invited to one of our festivals and there's free food and there's, there's free wine, <laughs> as much as you can drink. And they did a lot of that. And they sinned a lot. And the fury of the Lord did not stop until 24,000 Israelites died that day because they sinned with sins of the flesh. How did they die? Moses ordered the family members to kill their own who have committed adultery with the women of Moab. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The darkness of idolatry. This is the beginning of the church. As the gospel is being promoted, then the light of Christ is going to overtake the whole world. And the love of the first Christians they defeated the entire Roman Empire. What many nations could not do with armies and weapons, 12 disciples and their disciples who practice the commandment of love, they defeated the Roman Empire and it became the Roman Christian Empire eventually. The longest empire, the Byzantine Empire, which lasted over 1,000 years. From 313, when St. Constantine made it legal for Christianity to exist, because before that, it was illegal for a Christian to exist. Rome would select the kind of religion you could practice. Rome would select and approve your religion. And one of the claims of the Romans was, you're not allowed to exist Noli set vo in Latin. You're not permitted to exist as Christians. But the light of the gospel and the love of Christ, the love of the apostles, the love of the early Christians replaced the darkness of idolatry with the love of the Holy Trinity. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, and does not know 
where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So if we still have jealousy, resentment, if we harbor ill feelings against a friend of ours, against someone in school, against our brother, neighbor, that means that we are we're still in need of a lot of healing. So if we do not love and if we cannot forgive, we're ill. Doesn't mean that we have to despair. We have to diagnose ourselves with this illness. We have to know that this is something that disconnects us with Christ. And we simply need to use the discipline of our church to be healed. And that's why the church is here. The church is a hospital. Whatever illness we have, spiritual illness, the church has the tradition and the medicine to help us. And I will close with another story that maybe some of you may have heard by Athanasios, the taxi driver who uh, was here a few months ago. And does any, anybody remember him speaking about Zafiris, the person called Zafiris? Do you remember that story, Hariklia? Okay, I will just say it very quickly. It's kind of a sad story, but also with a good happy ending, I believe, if that's possible sometimes in this life. Of course, this life is not about happiness, it's about entering the kingdom. But this was quite a sad story. It started out as a love affair between two people from high school. They were high school sweethearts. They were getting ready to get married. And um, back in Greece at the time, most people had a motorcycle. This is back in the 90s probably. And Zafiris used to race with a motorcycle. Well, a day before his wedding, one of the other young men, from the way it sounds that he was jealous of him or he, they were not getting along, he went up to him and says, listen, let's race. And Zafiri says, not today, I'm getting married tomorrow. I really don't feel like racing. And he continued to coax him to race. Come on, let's race. What's wrong with you? You know, you're going to lose. And he just continued to pressure him. Zafiri said no. And unfortunately, this young person who at the time acted like Cain, he took his motorcycle, went down the street, turned around, and then he guided his motorcycle after doing a wheelie right up on the motorcycle of Zafiris, struck Zafiris at the forehead. The other person was going so fast that he was killed instantly. Zafiris survived after many operations. I don't remember how many. He stayed a paraplegic for over 30 years. Yestimani, his wife-to-be, his bride-to-be, never used her wedding gown. She remarried much later, but she used a different gown, obviously. And when I visited Zafiri in a hospital about two months ago with Athanasi, I said, Zafiri, have you forgiven the person who destroyed your life? He says, Kiria Costa, I forgave him with all my heart. And every time Mr. Thanasi takes us to monasteries, the first thing I do is write his name first on the paper that I hand in for people to be prayed for. And 10 days ago, out of no communication over 30 years, Gestimani called him to tell him that she thinks about him and she still loves him as a brother because she's married now to another man. Last night, Zafiris was taken to eternal life. Last night? Yeah. Last and we prayed for him at the memorial service. He had a heart ailment of some sort. It was sudden, but he was confessed. He communed. This is a very powerful example of what can happen if we allow the grace of God to work in us. This is where Christ says, there's nothing you can do without me. That's what he's talking about. These things, these difficult things, we cannot do without the help and the grace of Christ. The same week, I was in Kos, visiting my uncle in another hospital. And I saw another man from Nis Nisiros next to my uncle, and I went up and talked to him. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Pandali. And we talked a little bit. And I said, uh, is your family here? He says, yes, my, this is my daughter. And I said, how is your, is your wife working? Or and he says, no, I have no wife. And then he told me his story. He said, some men took my wife, and I prayed to God, and I vowed that before I die, now imagine, this man is ready to die. He had a stroke. We don't know if he's going to make it or not. So I'm talking to him. And he says, I promised to myself, and I vowed, that before I die, if I find him, I will pour gasoline on him and light him on fire. And I said, my friend, you're not ready to die. I pray that God doesn't take you because you are not ready to go. Your soul is not ready. 
And I will pray that you stay alive because with this kind of uh, thinking, you're headed in the wrong direction. I did tell him that. I believe you're going to live. Do you understand what you were trying to tell him? Perhaps. Uh, he was looking at me on the way to Athens. He, he was on the same plane, but his daughter was sitting next to him, so I couldn't continue the conversation. But what I'm saying is you can see the difference where you have darkness without Christ, what we could be without Christ, human nature without Christ, and Zafiri with the grace of Christ. Yes, Lesbina. Uh, uh, for Zafiri, uh, why didn't you uh, Why she didn't marry him? Because he broke every one of his bones and he spent the rest of his life laying on a hospital bed. A paraplegic is someone who cannot walk. He could move his hands a little bit, he could make his cross, but he could not walk. He was on a wheelchair. It took him many, many years to recover. He was going for treatment after treatment, and it was not a good idea to get married. It would be very difficult for that young girl to marry him. Do you agree? It would be very difficult. She would have to be a saint to marry someone like that. And we have women who are saintly and will marry a blind person, uh, will marry someone who has an ailment. It takes a very strong person. Yeah, I don't remember the story quite well. Yeah. I also remember well the woman he was going to marry was with child. Yeah, I don't want to say that. <laughs> okay, but, I mean, that, that's, that yeah. makes his to Vasanistirio worse yes. because he wasn't recognized. Right. And this is what we're going to do. We were going to try to go to Viotia. We were trying to arrange a meeting with his daughter. His daughter is about 30 years old. This girl doesn't know anything about him. So I said, it is best to go and find and see. Is she married? Is she single? Can she handle this information? So I said, it's best to really go and find the priest of that area and get to know some information first. And uh, Athanasia agreed, and that was the idea. Because that was his great desire. He really wanted to speak to his wife and also his daughter. But look at the grace of God. Without anybody doing anything, God granted this wish to him. And Yestimani called him 10 days ago. Isn't that amazing? Out of nowhere. I look at that as a little gift from God. And I think an indication that uh, Zafiri really reached his Christian potential. He pleased God with his patience and his forgiveness for this young person who destroyed his life. Yes, Yanni. Um, did it like talk about, about the guy Balaam you're talking about? Does he talk does he, like mention it in the book? Who uh Balaam? In the Old Testament. You go to the book of Numbers. Just go on Google and put Balak and it'll tell you exactly where you're gonna find him. Is Balaam the only one who talks about the star of Bethlehem? Out of Judah there'll be a star. Yes, but also I believe that Daniel had prophecies about the coming of the Messiah and the 70 weeks. I mean, I haven't seen this written anywhere, but when I was studying Daniel, I had the feeling that the Babylonians, that they really loved Daniel, and they had great respect for Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel so famous. He gave Daniel so many privileges. So they were they were reading the writings of Daniel, and it is possible that they would know about the 70 weeks of Daniel. But I haven't seen that by any of the church fathers, so I will hold back my theory. Any other questions? Yanni. Okay. Uh, about the, doesn't it say, like, the Baniya Zimmer? Yeah. Uh, like, Yes, the Panagia is not sinless. She has the ancestor sin. She was born with the ancestor sin, like all of us. However, because of her great purity, the consequences of the ancestral sin did not affect. Some church fathers say that she had some of the weaknesses of the human nature. For instance, like a mother, she worried a little bit when she lost Jesus when he was 12 years old. At that moment, she still couldn't really conceptualize that Jesus is the second person of the Holy Trinity, or she wouldn't have any worries at all. She knew he was the Messiah, but again, she's human. She's one of us. This is the human nature. It's not a sin for a mother. She was at the state of Theosis in the, in the Holy of Holies. Yeah, St. Silwan says that she didn't even sin in thought. No. For someone not to sin in thought, they are Theosis.
ότι ένα καθηγητή στο σχολείο. Ναι. Ε, και μου λέει εδώ πέρα αυτά τα βιβλία έχουν κάνει του Αμερικανού άθεου. Λοιπόν, και του λέω, κοίταξε αυτά, δεν τα ακολουθούμε πια. Και μου λέει, ο Χριστό όμω είπε ότι δεν ήθελα να καταργήσει τον νόμο, αλλά να το συμπληρώσει. Ε, πού είναι το όριο, με ρώτησε ο Άγγελο αυτό το πράγμα, Πού είναι το όριο ότι καταργούμε όλε αυτέ τι διατάξει, κρατάμε, ποιε αφήνουμε, ποιο το κανόνισε αυτό. Όσα θέλουμε κρατάμε, όσα θέλουμε αφήνουμε, πώ γίνεται. The law of the Old Testament applies because the Ten Commandments apply. The liturgical law was a foreshadow, the sacrifices, the sacrifice at the temple, all that was a prefigurement of the perfect sacrifice, which is Christ. That's the liturgical life. Absolutely. All these things, these are the liturgical law to keep people fearing and revering God. God is slowly trying to elevate the spiritual level of the people. You have to understand how wild and really backwards and crude humanity was back then. There was total darkness. It was idolatry. People burned their children. It was horrible. They sacrificed their children to the gods. This is what the Israelites had to deal with. If God would have given them the law of the gospel, they would never accept love your enemies. You killed your enemies in the Old Testament. You cut their heads off like ISIS does because that's what ISIS is. They take the Old Testament and they paraphrase it and that's how they came up with the Quran. That's what Muhammad did. That's why they say God. In the Old Testament, people say, Christians say that God was a lot harsher. Or... Right. It's the same God, but God is really allowing the people to live their life out. That's who they are. God doesn't change. God is the same, but they would not accept any kind of higher theology. That's the only thing they understood. They understood power in the Old Testament. War. You defeated your enemies. Στην έξοδο τάδε κεφάλαιο τάδε αυτό και του είπε ότι ε, you kill the uh, witches. Yes. Ε, αν κάποια γυναίκα τη βιάσει να κάνει witchcraft, τη σκοτώνει. Και μου λέει ο Άγγελο, πώ τώρα, τι απαντάει σε αυτόν τον καθηγητή. Δηλαδή, τι πράγματα μαθαίνει η παλιά διαθήκη στου ανθρώπου να σκοτώνουν no. τη μάγισσα. No, this is, this is not. Πράγμα, these people are blinded. These professors are atheists. And they have no idea how to interpret the Old Testament. This is what would happen in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if somebody didn't like you, they would come up and say, you know what, she's a witch. And they came and killed you. No problem. Now God takes this out of the hands of the people and tells them, no, you cannot go and blame somebody that she's a witch and have a mob go and kill half a village because of that. What you have to do is you have to bring that person to the Sanhedrin. She has to be judged. She has to. So what God is doing is taking the law out of the hands of the people and using wisdom, using a few people with discretion to reduce the killing. The same thing. If your son or your daughter curses you and you are the father or the mother, That child has to be stoned to death in the Old Testament. And now the atheist professor who doesn't have the help of the church is going to say, look at this. This is atrocious. This is horrible. They have no idea that back then you didn't need any permission to kill your child. If a child was born and the husband didn't want a female, he told the wife, give me the child. He took her back in the woods. The child was gone. Just like the Spartans. That still happens today, right? In some cultures. Yeah, in China. Okay. So this is what happened. God takes this law and rephrases it, takes this power out of the husband. If a child curses the father or the mother, the father no longer has the power. He needs to wait until the next hearing, which means what? After a day or two, the father has come down and none of the children got stoned. Because we don't see any stonings of children in the Old Testament. 
So what God is doing, he's using their mentality. He's outsmarting them. Now, what did we see uh, this past Sunday? The Canaanite woman. I love that gospel. Now, she's chasing Christ. Obviously, she wants to be healed. She wants her daughter to be healed. But Christ is now using the attitude of the disciples. This was the attitude of the disciples. He's expressing the mentality of his disciples. And he says, oh, no, no, uh, the, the bread is only for the children of Israel. That's not Christ. He's really putting the words of the, his disciples in his mouth. After the disciples saw her faith and they said, Lord, give her what she wants. Now, the word apolison doesn't mean you can't blame these people. They don't know Greek. See, the word apolison doesn't mean get rid of her. Now, the apostles, they have love. They have love. They wouldn't say to Christ, get rid of this woman. Christ is waiting for them to tell him what to do. So he wouldn't scandalize them. Lord, give her what she wants so she can be on her way. And that's when he heals her. Chariklia. Um, my one friend, she's like Chinese and... Um so she told me that she was adopted because like one of her, because like I guess her parents have like over the limit of kid, kids. So now, yeah, she's like adopted. And, yeah. yeah, she was the for, she was a fortunate one. Yes, Despina. Uh, why uh, in the old days, why did people like families want boys? rather than girls? That's a good question, Vespina. Um, because back then, back then, Vespina, most of the jobs had to do with farming and having to wrestle with bulls and cows. And usually, uh, the boys are a little bit stronger. Uh, usually. Not always. <laughs> so back then, it was very important for the livelihood of a family to have men, to have boys, 